All right, Joe Buck, Monday Night Football star, one of the best football voices, sports voices of his generation. What's going on, brother? How are you? Good to be on with you. I, I have to apologize. I was supposed to be on last week, and I was so sick after that Tampa Bay game, uh, not because it was 32-9 to 9 or whatever it was, but uh, <laughs> I just – I had – like bronchitis or something. So I tapped yeah. out last week. I never do that. I'm glad we can uh, we can get this done. Can I ask you, since you brought it up, the voice, when it starts to go, do you have to like shut it down? You're just like, I everybody get away from me. I'm not going to talk for 48 hours. Like, how do you process that? It's like a pitcher, you know, when he's a little bit tight, it's just like, it's it's your it's your bread and butter, your voice. Like, how do you process that when you're like, uh-oh, pipes are starting to go? Yeah, you would think, uh, but I'm too big of an <laughs> egomaniac narcissist to not talk. Uh, and I've got five-year-old twins. So I think what I do is for a number of days, I just refrain from yelling mm. uh, instead of uh, just kind of letting them have it and being the old grumpy 54-year-old father of five-year-olds. So I just kind of cool it. I pick my spots and then it's just tea after tea and uh pray that it comes back is that throw coat tea or, or we have a special joe buck concoction uh it's a concoction there's throw coat in there um our old audio guy at fox that worked in the booth uh is and was john bon jovi's guy for the longest time in the postseason one year i mean it's a name drop but it has nothing to do with me it's more his name drop but he said what you do <laughs> is throat coat tea lemon throw in a halls menthol cough drop into the tea and it just kind of cooks in there and makes the whole experience kind of mentholated that takes it to the next level and so i've been doing that ever since and it came back over the course of five days to where when we were in baltimore it was good enough uh to call that game and and i'm a believer in the john bon jovi throat coat <laughs> exercise all right, let's talk about that game. Um, being at that angle, being around the Ravens and talking to everybody, the most impressive thing about Lamar Jackson to you is what, Joe? Um, just beautiful directness. I, I don't think, you know, we, we went into that game talking, everybody was talking about one and three in the playoffs, hadn't been in a playoff game in three years, pressure, pressure, pressure. And and it's almost like you feel scared to ask when you're in a production meeting, like, hey, Lamar, are you feeling any pressure because you're one and three in the playoffs? Troy asked it, which I was glad he did. And he's just like, no, no. I mean, that's that's the past. Um, it doesn't matter. I can't wait to go out and play him antsy. Um, I, I just want to win a Super Bowl. And, and it's – I believe him. I think some guys talk about a pressure – and saying that they're able to put it to the side. And I don't believe them. I, I, you can just see it all. It's dripping off of them. And, and when Lamar Jackson said that, and you take in the body language and the way he said it, and then you go on and, and add to it the way he played, especially in right. that second half, uh, I, I believe him. So I, I don't think he adds anything extra to the menu right. that, he, that he needs to, and, and it, it works for him. Yeah, I, there's there, so many guys like, oh, I, I ignore the noise. I don't read my social media comments. It's like, okay, dude, I see you over there. Your hands shaking and you're 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 refreshing and you're searching your name. I got gotcha. you. Um, Lamar yeah. truly seems to be the type of guy who's just like, I I know what's in front of me. I'll go get that. Yeah, and and I I think I think that he is definitely the exception. I think there are a few people that I've run across over the years. I think Charles Barkley legitimately doesn't care what you or I or anybody thinks of him. And it's it's kind of a beautiful thing. It frees him up to say and do as he pleases. I, I feel like Barkley is going to live to be 110 because he has no stress. <laughs> I think we all put more stress on ourselves when we try to, and, and I've certainly been in this category, trying to please everybody. And yeah. you can't. You just flat out can't. And there are going to be some people that, that love you no matter um, there are going to be some people that can't stand you. And in the case of me, can't stand the sound of my voice. Don't like the, my pacing. Don't like, you know, perceived biases or whatever it is. And I'm never going to make them happy. So do I go into a game trying to make those people happy? Or do I just go do the game and, and just know that 
a certain percentage of the audience is going to love it. A certain percentage isn't. And as long as the people that sign my checks love it, that's re- and my family loves me, that's all that really matters. And, you know, I know how I go about approaching a game and yeah. what I try to do and the love I have for what I do. And, you know, the rest of it just doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So you're saying that you're the Lamar Jackson of broadcasting. That's what I'm gleaning from this. That's exactly, that's, yeah. that's my roundabout way of saying that I am <laughs> the potential and likely MVP uh, of the 2023 season because of my Lamar Jackson attitude. Absolutely. I knew, I knew that's where you were going with that. Hey, um, yeah. this might be a stupid question. So with Lamar, it just seems like you have to be on your toes as a play-by-play guy because nothing's ever dead. Nothing is ever – I mean, like, it's just a different rhythm than it would be a Joe Burrow or a, even, you know, Mahomes extends the plays, but not it's not like that. Um, is there a different kind of posture you have to take when you're looking at Lamar Jackson and anything is possible on that football field? It's a great question, and it's something that Todd Munkin talks about, and I hadn't ever really thought about it in these words or these terms, but he talks about having to make a defense defend a second play. Oh. And and I, you see that over and over again. You see the play that's called, it breaks down or it's not there, and now you as a defense have to defend the second play, which is him getting outside the pocket, him having the ability to th- just dump the ball over your head or make you think he's going to dump the ball over your head and then embarrass you with a move that's as good as anybody, any running back that's ever played in the game. He is – a legit dual threat, uh, Munkin and and Lamar Jackson, let's be honest, has worked very hard to yeah. up his completion percentage. He's been good inside the pocket. I think his in-pocket completion percentage was 10th best in the NFL this year. That is a big improvement. And then considering what he does outside of it and with his legs and the move he made on the 15-yard touchdown run on the defensive back in the hole, and I mean, he just has people grabbing at air. So it's He's a special guy. I, I think he's a he's become more of a leader, according to John Harbaugh. Yeah. And and I think it's going to take a Herculean effort by the Kansas City Chiefs to slow that roll down after what they did in the second half. So you and Troy just completed your 22nd year together, um, passing John Madden and Pat Summerall, which is crazy. That that is that is crazy longevity in an industry that does not promote longevity. Um, that's incredible. You get to go anywhere you want with this. Being around Troy Aikman, you probably learn a ton about football. And and it's stuff, and I've always said this, that I love having X players on because I could study something for, for 30 hours and say, okay, I know everything about Lamar Jackson. And then one defensive end can say, well, here's what you missed, you know? Um, and so Troy, just a different, a different thing. The most important thing or most impressive thing or thing you never would have thought about that you learned, learned from Troy Aikman when working together is what? Mm. Well, I, I, I think if if I can take this anywhere I want to take it, yeah. then the answer is what it takes to get ready for a game. Yeah. And and I I found out, I would say within three weeks back in 2002 when we started together, uh why the guy won three Super Bowls. I've yeah. I've never seen anybody operate like him. Uh it's maddening to somebody like me who I think defaults to lazy. Uh, but for somebody that has a lot going on, he's always early. He's always beyond prepared. Uh, and when he says he's going to do something, he does it and he will hold you to that standard. So it is it is a weekly fight by me. If we say, hey, we're, we're going to the 430 game in Baltimore and we're going to we're going to meet in the cars at 115. He's down there at 10 to one. And it <laughs> makes me crazy because my default would be to get there at 114, yeah. if not 115. And and it's just a drive that he has that I I have never I've never reached that in my life. So I, I yes, does he look at the game uh in, in his unique way? Absolutely. Did he did he decipher that Christian Harris of the Texans was spying on Lamar Jackson and yeah. that was the adjustment that they made after they couldn't really slow him down the first couple of drives. Yes, all that stuff's well and good. But I think his ability to prepare, uh, he prepares, and I've said this before, like a play-by-play guy. He has more stuff on his boards than I do. And it, it means that I can take the broadcast really in any direction. And he's going to be able to come off it, whatever I say, with something interesting. So it, it's, 
you combine that with a legitimate friendship and it's why we've been able to to be together as a team for 22 years and then we were at the right network before and we're at the right network now for that stuff to continue the one thing i love about this this nfl league and everybody says it's it's there's a lot of paranoia or whatever if you're just trying to talk ball with guys most guys will talk ball with you and it's really incredible just go into a training camp for me to me just a little old me and just say hey i just want to talk about your team this year and you'll get a lot of insights but production meetings are a different animal i mean that's that's you know time in a conference room or over zoom and you're just exchanging stuff and, and normally it's a lot of really good insight into what that team is and i'm curious if you're putting together an all production meeting team for guys in the league right now who is the coach I'm going to, and there, there. I would say there are more good ones than bad ones. Yes. Um, I'm going to piggyback off what Lisa Salter said the other day in an article with the Athletic. I think she did, uh, wow. where she said John Harbaugh. I, I John Harbaugh has transformed into a different human being. Five years ago, six years ago, maybe four years ago. Uh, defensive, prickly. Um, not a guy that's going to share information. I don't know what changed. I don't know if it's because maybe, maybe it was just us. Maybe it's because we had more Ravens games once we started doing Thursday yeah. nights at Fox and whatever. And he knew that he could trust us. Um, but he is unbelievable. Uh, their defensive coordinator, Mike McDonald. I, I hope he never changes. Uh, Todd Munkin, their offensive coordinator. We just left the best group. And th there are many. But this this was the one where we went into the game thinking, my God, we've got the entire game plan. We know he's saying stuff to us that he knows we will not sell him out on, mm -hmm. but that will give us background information to make better observations in the game. And it it's almost like a trap many times. And, and we had him with Aaron Rodgers with Green Bay, even Brett Favre with Green Bay. They'd talk for a long time. And it was like, what out of what we just heard is okay to say on the air? And what was said, even without them saying, hey, this is just between us, should we leave just for ourselves? And it's it's a minefield. And, and I think once you do it long enough and you know instinctually what they want you to say and what they don't, uh, and they know they can trust you, then it becomes just a, an open book. And, and that's when you really get a lot of information. I love that. Um real quick Mike McDonald story. So the first time I met him, he knew who I was. And he said, I'm a huge ringer fan. And I said, Oh, I'm getting, you know, I'm just tightening my time. I said, all right, here we go now. And he goes, no, no, no I'm talking about the game of Thrones coverage. I said, Oh, Jesus. Ah. Just didn't care. Well, about me. Did not care. About no, me. he just, but, wanted it, game but of he, Thrones. yeah, I, I, I really like that guy a lot. I think he's smart. He did the entire production meeting with us flipping a baseball around in his hand <laughs> and and i was like what are you working on a fork ball or what's going on and he goes no nope, it's just it's my stress ball and it was a major wow. league baseball that that he has in his hand I, I don't know if that's a that's a typical thing but i he's gonna make a hell of a head coach uh and and i think any team would be smart the two coordinators we just had bobby slowick and and mike mcdonald there isn't a team that would go wrong uh hiring either one of those two guys Totally agree. Uh, this might be the same answer, but, you know, Tariko was on the show recently and he was talking about Dan Campbell and, and how behind the scenes, he's just a different guy. He's not, he's not the guy in press conferences. And even if you watch press conferences, he's not a meathead. He's a very thoughtful guy. Is there a guy where you say, okay, behind closed doors, this guy's totally different than what appears on camera. Is there a guy where you just say, hey, everybody's misread this guy in the NFL? Mm. Uh, back in the day, that, that answer was always Tom Coughlin. Who was Colonel Coughlin, Lombardi time, taskmaster, old school. And then he would sit in a production meeting with us and it was therapy. And and yeah. he would tell you, he's, it's like, hey, coach, you know, last week, um, yeah, I know you don't want to talk about last week. We're focusing on this week. Uh, but that timeout you guys had to call. And then he would go on for 20 minutes. It's yeah. like, oh, we got to, we've got the next game to do. We don't really care about the last game, but it became therapy. I'd say another guy is Odell Beckham. I, I oh. Odell Beckham, even back in his early days with the Giants, um, and we were doing the game when he had that fight with the kicking net on the sideline. Oh, um, he was wonderful and, and was very open and really thoughtful in, in what he shared with us and, and had a real deep understanding of the game and, and I think cared about the personal side of it. 
And when you talk to the Ravens, not to make this a Ravens podcast, but uh, but John was talking about that. Troy asked him about about Odell, and and he had run into Odell. I ran into him at the ESPYS. I didn't even think he knew he would know who I was. And and we had a a nice talk for ten minutes before the show, and then Troy ran into him somewhere. And it's like it was a good reminder because we hadn't met with him because of the injuries in a production meeting in a long time. And it was like, man, we used to love talking to that guy. Uh, even, even when all that stuff was flying around and the, yeah. you know, the cruise before the green Bay game and, and all that other stuff, I, I thought he was very forthright and a guy that, uh, that I think had a level of understanding of what was going on around him that the average NFL fan probably, you know, didn't think he cared about. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. We do something on this show called Badasses, and it's the most badass person you've ever seen in football, been around in football, where you just know, okay, this guy grinded out. And it could be just some guy who who played his ass off and, and defied the odds. It could be a guy you knew was hurt and he still uh, you know, got 12 tackles or whatever. You have the floor. The biggest badass Joe Buck has ever seen in football is who? Wow, I never thought in those terms. Uh, it makes me makes me feel very ill prepared uh, <laughs> but uh i mean i i would say how can you ever say somebody not named jason pierre paul for all that oh, he yeah. went through yeah losing fingers having that phantom pain i assume yep be excruciating and put a club on your hand and go play in the nfl and use your try to use your hands instinctually there's no way to not use your hands it's it's right. impossible to ball your hand up in a club and say, Oh, well, well, I'm just going to come off the edge and not use my hands. And I I mean, that had to be otherworldly for him to play in the NFL after he had that fireworks accident. Uh, And then, and then Favre, I mean, my God, to have that many games in a row to be ear hold and limp around and get hit low and get hit in the knees when the league was different uh, than it is now to see him limp into a production meeting yeah. and not be faking it like legitimate and like kind of grown getting up, not complaining about it ever. And then just go play. Um, I, I, I think he qualifies, you know, you think badass, you think big guys, you think, you know, whoever with face paint and uh, <laughs> ripping, ripping shirts off and whatever. Yeah. But I, I think those guys can be badasses too. So I, those are the two that jumped to mind uh, right off the bat. Typically, and we're both around athletes a lot. The guys who say they're badasses are not badasses. Right. That that's pretty typical. The guys who like you said mentioned like the the eye black under the eyes and all that. Yeah. Stuff. Those guys. It's like you're trying just, too hard. Yeah. You, it's usually just marketing for those guys, and 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 they're not actual badasses. All right. The other thing we do is called one rep back. It's when we ask players to relive one moment of their career if they could get it back. And Peyton was on the show a couple weeks ago, Peyton Manning, uh, and said. You know, he loves 16 of his 28 rookie interceptions. That's all he wants. He wants 16 of them back. Um, but it's that kind of thing. For you, it's calls, obviously. You get to go back in time and redo one call. Where are you going, Joe Buck? The Randy Moss call, uh, mm. for sure. With the That's disgusting. I, I don't know why. And it, the irony of it all is, A, we were at Fox together for a brief while he was there. B, now we're at ESPN together. My wife, Michelle, does the pregame show. Of course. Um, of all the people on that pregame show, prior to even to our arrival, because he hasn't been there since we got there, uh, the nicest human being to my wife was Randy. And I would go like on Mondays and support her. And he'd be the guy that'd hop off the set and come yeah. down and we'd give high five, you know, like the the the, the handshake and the the hug, like the lean in hug. Uh it, it was I the more Time goes on, the more I think, man, I can't believe that even came out of my mouth, you know, like it seemed, you know, and, 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 and I can't, I never live in the, I want it back. I never live in, I wish I could take that back or delete it or whatever. I can't live like that. Like I have to be willing to accept a step on the wrong tile. If I'm also going to accept, you know, when things went great and I made the call that, that I love to hear when it comes on. But when I hear that call, I'm like, mm. you know, like that was, that was too far. I, I, I think, and I, and it was not calculated. You never, you never know what you're going to see when you go into a stadium and, 
You know, I, I think knowing more of the backstory after the fact about the fans and whatever, um, you know, doing that to the team bus, I understand it more uh, than I did in that moment. But I, again, I, it's not anything that keeps me up at night, but I think knowing more information now, that was one that I, I would probably come pull back a little bit on. Last thing for you. What does off season Joe Buck look like? Like, I know like you got kids. And so that's, I have a one-year-old and I know what's, what's filling my time, but like Joe Buck in April and May is doing what this year? Man, I, you know, I've, I've got kids coming and going. I've got a 27 year old (laughs) daughter that's getting married in a year. Um, I've got basically a year from today. Um, I've got a 24 year old, both those girls live in the city in New York. Um, and then I've got five and a half year old twins, uh, that will be six in, in, uh, April that keep me going morning, noon and night. So I, (laughs) I, I think guilt both times around as a dad for as much as I'm gone, uh, doing games. And now I'm gone way less doing no baseball. Um, it's always driven me to be as involved as I can be. And it's harder with my patience level at 54 to be as involved as I was in my late twenties, early thirties, as I was the first time around, but it's, it's, I mean, I, I sneak away and play golf, hit golf balls. Don't play a lot of golf, like 18 holes, but I'll go hit balls. That's my therapy. That's my, that's my uh, Zen is to just pull a ball over, hit it, pull a ball over, hit it. And just don't talk. Um, Act like my voice is gone. I like I've got laryngitis and not talk to anybody, be in my own world, but I it's, it's raising boys and trying to be the most present dad I can be. And hopefully a good dad that has patience uh, as best I can. That's beautiful. My therapy yesterday, we've been snowed in for a week and then it finally started a thaw yesterday. And all I did was take my, my uh, uh, radar gun, whatever you want to call it. It's not, it's not a full track man or anything. I just went in the backyard. And I just swung. I just swung back and forth. All I wanted to do was swing a golf club. That's all I wanted to do. That was my therapy. Yeah. I didn't need balls. It wasn't even hitting balls. It was just get me out there and just swing a golf club. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. That's called being yeah. a old man. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I hear you. It's uh, it makes me know that I would be a bad prisoner somewhere uh, yeah. unless they gave me a golf club or a putter. And then I'd be fine for a few years just sitting in a room with my thoughts and a putter, uh, just rolling balls against a wall, um, playing the Masters, having Jim yep. Nance narrate it in my head as, as yep. I grew thinner and my hair fell out and my beard got longer and my ear hair grew over my eyes. And just to be clear, the putting would never actually help our game. It would just, it would just pass. No, hours. it doesn't actually help. Nothing actually helps. No. As we know, nothing helps. Nothing helps. I, I just got a swing tip from Scott McCarron uh, that he sent me that I think is probably going to change my life <laughs> until it doesn't work after three tries. And then I'm, I'm on to the next thought that jumps into my small head. I mean, my big head, small mind. Beautiful. Joe Buck, Monday Night Football, thank you so much for coming on, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.